All right, I think we should get going, team. So welcome everybody who joined uh, our webinar on the future state of dynamic pricing and offer. I'm Blair Cook. I'm the SVP of our customer success and delivery team here at Datalex. Um, kind of our agenda for today is to, um, I'm going to give just a little introduction on kind of the state of the industry. Um, after that, we're going to talk with uh, Ben Singleton um, from JetBlue. He's going to talk to us a little bit about how data and analytics are used within the airline context, and then importantly, a uh, use case that JetBlue is doing here um, on dynamic seat pricing. After that, we'll, we'll hand it over to Bobby, uh, Bobby Healy, who's a um, longtime executive within the travel and hospitality space, uh, formerly, uh, currently executive director with Car Trawler, um, former C CTO, and now is working on a very exciting project around drone delivery. And then Connor O'Sullivan will talk a little bit about dynamic pricing in the context of what we're seeing in the industry here at Datalex. And Connor runs our product management team for Datalex and is driving our product strategy around dynamic pricing. So with that, I'll just jump into a little bit of an introduction here. Kim, I'm looking for the control. Here we go. Okay, just a little bit about Datalex. Um, before we get started, uh, Datalex is focused on the airline industry. We have a digital commerce platform that that um, that is in the airline space, servicing airlines. You know, on a global uh, uh, globally, we have uh, airlines in China with Air China H and A Group. We have uh, European carriers with Air Lingus, the likes of uh, Scandinavian Airlines SAS, Brussels Airlines, and then of course we have. North American Airlines with JetBlue here in New York, uh, which is where I'm currently at today, and then um, Air Transat up in Canada. And then we do have a South American and Central American presence with the likes of Copa. Um, large scale digital platforms, you know, processing over a hundred million, you know, offers um, on an annual basis. So very large, large scale, high volume transactional system in the digital space. Um, what I'm going to start with is just a little bit of overview of the, um, of the airline industry of where we are right now. I think, you know, when you look at the, that, uh, where we've gone in, you know, in, in time, there are certain events that have occurred in history, which you measure the before and after. So if you take a pretty dramatic event, the birth of Jesus, you know, you measure things relative to the birth of Jesus before Christ, after death or ABC, AD. We have the Industrial Revolution, where we talk about what happened before the Industrial Revolution, after the Industrial Revolution. If you zoom into the airline industry, and specifically maybe in the U.S. market, you kind of think about what it was like pre-9-11 and post-9-11. And of course, now we've hit COVID-19. So I think we have to start thinking about what were things like before COVID-19 or BC-19, and what will they be like after COVID-19 or AC-19? And what are you going to do kind of provocatively right now to get yourself into the recovery mode as an airline? So, you know, if you look at BC-19, what, what were we looking at just, you know, leading up to really the March timeframe? We had unprecedented passenger growth, unprecedented revenue growth, um, unprecedented profitability. You know, we had really this evolution of frictionless borders where people were traveling globally without a lot of restrictions between the borders. We had, you know, a growth in, in uh, order books for new airlines. Just basically uh, the airline industry leading up to, you know, mid-March was in the best place it's been in the, in the history of the, um, of the industry. Airlines hadn't achieved their cost of capital for pretty much the entire um, history of the airline up until the previous five years to COVID-19. Of course, now we've immersed ourselves into COVID-19 and, you know, what does it look like now? Obviously, huge impact to the industry. Uh, bankruptcies are occurring, you know, up, upwards of 80 to 90% for most airlines and reduction of revenue and capacity. Uh, you know, passenger sentiment has changed dramatically um, from, you know, wanting to travel and, and getting on airplanes on a, on a regular basis to worrying about what a travel experience might be like right now. The geopolitical climate is changing dramatically to be, much more of this uh, uh, regulated um, borders and, and, and more friction between the borders. People have quarantines on, very complicated, very complicated to travel just in the U.S., but if you're traveling globally, it's, you know, following 
where you are with the quarantine requirements and what quarantine requirements is very difficult now. And basically you got to start thinking about, you know, what are you going to do to just survive before you even thrive in this industry? And what will the recovery curve look like? I think when we entered COVID-19, everybody was hoping we would have this V-shaped recovery where you might have a steep decline followed by a quick recovery. And I think we started to see that. But of course, you know, and, and notably for the South American market, maybe it was more of an L-shaped recovery where it went down and it, and it hasn't been improving that much. The United States, that's been, you know, kind of a similar, similar recovery curve also. But the question is, what is it going to look like over the next six to 12 months? Very, very unknown, but we do know there's going to be massive disruption. And by, by all accounts, you know, it'll probably be two to three years to recover back to 2019 levels. So Basically, what are we going to do first to survive? But secondly, what are we going to do to thrive in the industry? And what we're seeing in a lot of areas is, you know, a lot of themes evolving around um, what, what it's going to take to recover. First of all, I already mentioned it's probably two to three years to recovery. So we got to make sure we make the right moves now. We are going to see a lot more friction between the borders. So I think having the capability to um, identify what restrictions and requirements are in place you know, partnerships are going to evolve. Data, which we're going to talk about, is going to be a huge player. Data and information to make decisions. Airlines are going to have to be very innovative. You know, loyalty is going to be key to get through this. You, um, you know, the things we do to make our passengers and customers loyal to our brand will be hugely important. Sustainability now is evolving as a big outcome of, of this crisis. But importantly, you know, dynamic pricing and offer is going to be a major way airlines are going to be able to take advantage and optimize the revenue that is available on the backside of this crisis as we come out of it. So with that, that obviously leads into our topic around dynamic pricing. So I think where we'll go from here is to have a little bit of conversation with Ben about Ben Singleton from JetBlue around how data is used at JetBlue currently and then what they're doing around dynamic seat pricing. So with that, Ben, I'll turn it over to you. I'll get your first slide. Great, thank you. Um, nice to be with you all um, this morning. Um, so I wanted to talk about sort of two, well, let me actually first start with a bit of an introduction. So I started at JetBlue just over a year ago. Um, and in my previous role, I was, um, it's my first time working in the airline industry. Before that, I was actually the director of analytics for the New York City Police Department. Uh, so I have a running joke now that more or less whichever uh, company or organization I go to work for, uh, I'm somehow cursed in some way. So don't let me work for your airline or your technology <laughs> company. Uh, but I'm hoping that we'll, uh, uh, we'll get out of this sooner than later. Um, but my, my background is as a, uh, as a data scientist, as a developer, as an engineer. I'm a, a programmer and I've sort of moved my way from uh, being the engineer to uh, sort of the more management and strategic side of things. So when I first got to JetBlue, one of the first things that I noticed was that we had a strong data foundation and there was a program uh, called Foundations um, that was honestly even ahead of its time. It really worked on getting access, you know, JetBlue recognizing that having access to our own data in real time was a core need for the business. Um, we couldn't rely on external partners to supply us with insights or other things along those lines. We really needed that information ourselves. Um, so we built some real-time pipelines um, for our core data sets, our flight data, our booking data, ticketing, check-ins, et cetera, the data sources that you might expect um, that you might need to make real-time decisions. Of course, the infrastructure that it was built on, you know, five or so years ago has evolved many times over, but the underlying strategy of the program um, was very much aligned with, um, I think, now what everybody is trying to do. This sort of brings me to this first point, what the slide is trying to get around, which is, you know, getting access to your own data, organizing it well, and curating it, um, is a foundational need for any airline today. I think it's a foundational need for any company today, but I think it's frequently overlooked. And one of the questions that I sort of pressed when I first got to JetBlue was to ask about some data sets that maybe aren't immediately core to the business, um, but I think represent a good test of, um, 
of how well you're collecting data. So, you know, from your website, do you have all of your clicks and page searches and how accessible is that? You know, to give you a sense at JetBlue, that data set for us for a couple of years is 15 billion rows long by 500 columns wide. It's a really, really large data set. What about every one of your email marketing, uh, you know, email campaigns? Do you have all the clicks and the opens? Um, do you have your in-flight entertainment data? What movies are being watched, et cetera? Do you actually own that or do you rely on your business partner to provide you with those insights? Now, of course, there's a prioritization and a tier of what matters more than other data sets. You know, your in-flight entertainment data is maybe something you can get to after you cover your bookings, your flight data, your crew operations data, et cetera. But I think it's something that um, everyone who's at the intersection of digital and technology at an airline needs to plan around. You need to have this data set organized. So we've spent the last year or so investing in kind of state-of-the-art modern cloud-based technologies. We're 100% cloud now when it comes to our analytics side. We leverage a data warehouse called Snowflake, uh, which you may have heard of. It's one of these Silicon Valley unicorn companies now valued at you know, a gajillion dollars. Um, and also use some other sort of new data transformation tools. We've moved our way out of some of the legacy Microsoft SSIS on-premise parallel data warehouses to fully cloud. And it enables a tremendous amount. I mean, we need access to data 24 seven um, at any time very quickly. And our analytic data warehouse not only handles our batch data, which we receive you know, either several times a day or once daily from business partners, uh, but it also handles that real-time data. So we can have dashboards that are displaying uh, flight delays or other changes in our operation in sub five minutes, sort of two to three minutes. And that's at the point where we can actually use this data for real-time decision-making. Of course, traditionally, you would use analytic data sets for trends, for analyzing trends and sort of projecting the future and getting smarter about that. So I sort of wanted to start off by taking this time to say, before you get fancy and get into your dynamic offers, um, although you can do these two things in parallel, you really need to invest uh, in your underlying data platform. Uh, and don't let that, uh, uh, don't forget about that piece. Um, so let me uh, take you a bit into one of the use cases that we uh, have spent the last couple of months working on. Um, you know, to be honest, it is still a work in progress, but we have a good prototype that we're excited about. So as we worked with different parts of the company, um, we recognized that one of the areas we could get smarter was around our even more space C pricing. This is a product that for us is more than a $300 million business and was projected to grow. Obviously things have changed, but one of the things that we recognized was that this product was thriving and yet our approach to pricing was somewhat primitive. Uh, there was a pricing analyst in the revenue management, uh, on the revenue management team who on occasion was getting to updating prices, but of course it's, you know, you know at a thousand or 1200 flights a day, um, you know, projected out nine months for our schedule. It was just far too many flights for any one analyst to manage. And we had to get to the point where our seat prices were being dynamically updated. Uh, so uh, in the early stages of the, this process, we actually met with our, uh, with our team at Datalex with Blair and sort of understood the rules engine that we could apply and an underlying seat pricing file that we wanted to dynamically generate um, that Datalex could then use to change prices on the fly as certain conditions were being met as laid out in that seat pricing file. So that was sort of the big picture vision. We, we worked with about uh, two to three data scientists. Um, some were internal and we also had some support um, uh, from an external consulting agency. And what we looked at doing was building a machine learning model that predicted uh, what we at JetBlue called the attach rate or the take rate for even more, even more space. So given the information we knew about the flight, um, historical information about it, right, what time it was leaving, you know, all of the basics, um, uh, but then information as well about uh, the destination and, and some enriching it with a, a few other pieces of data. We built out this machine learning model that predicted the attach rate. 
And that ultimately fed itself into a second model um, that was an optimization model that basically applied some guardrails, right? You, you didn't want to suddenly increase prices so dramatically, right? We probably wanted to make stepwise changes in pricing uh, in both directions, for example. So, you know, we, we worked on this project in the very early stages of coronavirus and, um, and we were excited to implement it. And of course, things changed so dramatically. So what we recognize, and I think this is an important lesson to walk away with, is that you can uh, spend the time and the effort building a really fancy machine learning model that is trained on historical data. And one of the big challenges is that we can't really use that historical data right now to tell the future about airline pricing or seat pricing. The world is just too different from our history. Um, and machine learning models don't generally work that well if, uh, if behavior is changing quite quickly, especially if you've trained, trained your model on lots of historical data. So what we've actually moved towards, and I think this is something that you all could consider, is just a more rudimentary model. How do you pin your seat prices to a percentage of the total fare that's being paid um, or compared to seats in similar markets? Basically, take a more basic approach, leave some of the machine learning at home to start, uh, but you can actually build something in that you can deploy quite quickly and is a lot better than having a human uh, making these decisions on your behalf because you just won't be able to react as quickly as you need to in an environment that's changing this quickly. So sort of my, my quick overview of this project, I you know could spend a lot of time going into great uh, amounts of detail on how the machine learning model works, et cetera, but, um, but I would rather, you know, wait for questions at the end or whenever we're taking them to, uh, yeah. to answer them for you all. But anyways, uh, thank maybe, you. Maybe one question for you. I have several questions and we'll follow up on a few of your topics, but what do you think the opportunity is for dynamic seat pricing for JetBlue, if you, don't, if you can share that? You know, what, what do you think the upside opportunity is? I mean, when we had uh, scoped it out, we thought, it, we thought we could do several percentage points better than we were doing today by a very conservative measure. And so if you think about even a few percentage points on a $300 million number with an upside maybe as big as 10 or 20% if you were really sophisticated, I mean, it represents a tremendous opportunity. So, you know, getting smarter in this area is a, a whoever's last to this will lose. And I think the winners have to be really good uh, from the dynamic pricing side. Yeah, so I think a couple, couple key take takeaways is one is get your data because anything we're going to do around dynamic pricing is going to require the data to be able to support the decision making. Second is you can deploy a crawl, walk, run strategy in where you could think you need to do something fairly sophisticated, but quite frankly, if you have the data and you make some, some do some good analytics on it, you have a lot of upside potential. And then obviously most uh, shameless plug is you need a platform where you can take that data and get it to the customer, those prices of the customer quickly. And that's, that's where we've kind of played a role at DataLex. Absolutely. That pipeline. So, okay, we'll, have, we'll come back to Ben for some more questions, but from here, I think we'll transition over to Bobby. As I mentioned, Bobby's a non-executive director currently for Car Trawler, spent a lot of time at Car Trawler and um, is now, you know, really an innovative technology leader working on, on a drone delivery project, but ha or a company has a lot of experience in the travel and hospitality space. So maybe I'll just tee you up, Bobby, and let you talk a little bit about what you're observing in the industry maybe draw a little bit off, off of one of Ben's comment about how current demand models are dramatically changing now and how we as an industry are going to have to adapt to, to, you know, that coming out of this coronavirus uh, pandemic. So over to you, Bobby. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, pleasure, pleasure to be here. Um, I found it very interesting, Ben. Thanks for that. Uh, a lot of uh, echoed a lot of uh, my um, my own experience delivering ancillary selling systems for airlines, and funnily, I've been in the drone delivery space. Uh, same issues with collecting gigantic amounts of data and working with them. Um, I mean, just to give you a little bit into first of all what I've been doing the last you know, decade or so in the airline space first and then breaking down into what's important, what I feel is important for any airline thinking about dynamic pricing and really echoing a lot of what Ben said, 
possibly even turbocharging that. Um, I mean, my, my company, Car Trawler, we've been um, basically enabling ancillary revenue generation for airlines through third party, car rental, car hire, uh, taxis, those kind of things, and cross-selling that product along with, with flight. So we've, we've had the pleasure of being in the flight purchase funnel um, the whole way down for a number of over 100 different airlines, actually, and, and in every part of the world and every type of airline from low cost to hybrid to network carrier um, you, you name it we've seen the data and interestingly from our position in the technology stack we would have embedded you know image tracker or, or, or tracking pixels or we would receive through api a really rich data set from each of our airlines which would have the bulk of the itinerary or, or pre-selected itinerary through the flight funnel and we would be able to attach that to the offer of the of the non-air dynamic products we would sell and I'll come back to why that's important shortly because it's massively relevant to um, what you're going to be doing in dynamic pricing and so, so the, the net effect of us doing this is we, we are widgets and code is in the flight path of, of over 2 billion searches a year. And so we have a huge amount of data, obviously. Um, so, so the very first thing that we had to get right, and we grew over time because while similar to, similar to what uh, to Blair said or, or to what Ben said, we were tra traditionally, you know, Microsoft shop stacking hardware on top of hardware and growing that way um, with relational databases, uh, it very quickly doesn't work and, and you have to really you know, fix that as your starting point. And, and for us to enable the, just the gigantic scale of data that you need to be able to store and process to create decision logic around what is the best price, what is the order of things you show on the display, and what is the order of things or selection of products that you want to show based on the environment and the environment could be the sensitivity of that particular passenger profile to price it could be there's just been a, a volcanic eruption in iceland uh, to we're in covid so demand is extremely different and you might surface different products in different orders as well and um, so 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 the decisions that we wanted to be able to make in order to be qualified we would use machine learning for that I don't call it AI because it's not AI, but machine learning, the way it functions effectively is the more data you give it, the more accurate its predictions, the more data in terms of count and volume, but also in richness. So again, Ben mentioned there, you know, billions of data records, but also most importantly, he mentioned 500 columns wide. That 500 number is, is for us the, rich, the richness or the, or the quality of the data and the, the other number in terms of number records is the volume. But to be able to process that type of data, you need a, a very special architecture to, to both collect it, store it, and process it. And traditional systems that would exist in most, you know, most businesses of any type of age, particularly airlines, simply wouldn't be able to cope. And that's where, you know, I laughed that again at Ben talking about Snowflake and the quadrillion dollar value that that company has. The reason it has a quadrillion that, you know, dollar value is because it enables that decision logic to be implemented. And up until now, the industry has not had the tools to implement or to enable data science programmers. So data scientists in, in car trawler, you know, would have been able to, to, to work with 50 million, 100 million, maybe 200 million records and, and write an algorithm that would you know, generate dynamic pricing or, or just as important as dynamic pricing, the sort order or filtering of the products that you show to consumers. So that decision logic was based on a narrow set of data and was asynchronous. So it would take maybe a day, maybe two days to generate the output from those algorithms to affect the display that we, we ran. Um, and that, you know, that was very good start and served our business well for many years. But when we moved and also to a snowflake environment, um, 
when we moved to that, put in the cloud, put in snowflake, we started to, to be able to achieve not just, you know, far shorter time frames of implementation and iteration of processes, but we were able to consume more data. And so, so now in Cartrawler, we record, you know, not just the searches that customers do or, or, the, or the funnel interactions that a customer has with our widget, but we also record the positions and all of the attributes of 150 products that we surfaced to that customer at that time. So it's not about clicks, not about bookings, but about actual impressions, which is an order of magnitude larger data set than clicks or bookings. And, and why that's important, I don't want to get too much into the madness of it, but why it's important is, you know, it's impossible to create heuristic based uh, decision making to decide what is the best order of things or what is the best price of things or what is the best filtering of things to optimize selection and conversion in any product set. So you need to have a machine, uh, you need to use machine learning for that. And, and so we chose to not just record what we, what user interacted with us, but also what we actually showed to them. And that lets us look back at the last three days or 30 days or whatever and, and spray lots of different random tests against consumers without doing anything manual, but actually intentionally manipulate sort order, product order, filtering order to generate a very wide and diverse data set that then looking back, we could choose what is the best permutation of relationships of product on the display bearing in mind the context of price and all sorts of other attributes. So, so we really took that to the, and still do to the just crazy, insane levels of optimization. And, and I would suggest that that's somewhere where an airline thinking about dynamic pricing needs to think far more than just the price. They need to think about the context and the environment that you're showing that price in and what else is on the display beside that price. So that's that's my starting uh, speech, Blair. Um, that gives an idea of what I've been up to. I think. Yeah, yeah. I think I think the one thing that I was I was thinking about when you were talking about it is how, you know, if you look back, just really you're in both the technology space and then our industry and the airline industry. One, we were all talking about dynamic pricing, but there were kind of two hurdles. One was the technology itself that it really hadn't yet matured maybe maybe a little bit more than a year ago but probably maybe a year ago is when we started making some great strides i i worked on the platform ben is talking about before that but we didn't have some of these technologies sort of to deal with this data was challenging that started to evolve into a lot better place now then on the flip side is airlines were really not prepared to make big step changes in the way pricing was done because it's risky you know, it's risky as you're, you're, you're dealing with the revenue stream, but I guess, you know, a couple of perfect things have kind of come to fruition now. Kim, did you take over the, the, uh, deck? <laughs> yeah. Um, but a couple of things have come into fruition. Now, one is the technology's improved. So it's key to collect that data as both Bobby and, and Ben were talking about. But secondly, we've got this event now that's occurring, which has really changed the dynamic and we have to be innovative and we have to start to test and learn from this dynamic pricing model. You so know, know, Blair, just, just on that, you know, because I didn't address that clearly when I was talking, that, that, where, that where that gets important is, look, COVID obviously completely changes the nature of demand, not just the volume of it, but the nature of it. And so what, what's important for an airline or, or any e-commerce business to get right is that you train the the, the models or the algorithms, you, you feed it with recent data. And that means you need to be able to run and rerun the models very, very frequently. Yeah. As from, from a day-to-day -day basis, news comes out, good news, bad news, all these things come out that if you don't have your model trained on a daily or maybe weekly basis, it's working on, if it's working on last year's data, you, you know, you're making all the wrong decisions. So, so that, but that for me is a technical thing. In other words, you need a platform and the capability to just really iteratively, very, very quickly retrain the model based on that, on that recent data set rather than relying on 
you know, very, very batch and slow approaches. Yeah. To it. Then, then you need an ecosystem to be able to get that to the customer, as you were saying, correct? I mean, ultimately you can have these algorithms running, but if you don't have a way to get it to the customer. A hundred percent. Yeah. hundred percent. Like all the algorithms in the world just provide a data set. And, and how do you present that data set, that results to the consumer? And that's about a connection, a good connection, a logical connection between that presentation and, and the layers up to the presentation and the raw output of the algorithms. And that's yeah. frequently missed, very frequently missed. Yeah. The uh, thing I think about of what both of you are saying also too is, you know, if you can get your electronic world in sync with your physical world through this real-time data and make that gap between the electronic world and the physical world as small as possible. Yeah. That's well, great. Just an implementation, um, I'm not sure what the numbers are now in car trawler, but I, I, I recall that, that that kind of gap, so, so you have machine learning algorithms produce an output, and for us that output was two or three million recommendations to be processed in real time by the, by the comparator, by, by the engine that ultimately decided what it's going to show to consumers, and that would go through basically an output that was about two or three million records that had to be processed in real time. And, and luckily for us, that all fit in memory on our server. So there was no, there wasn't this mad layer in the middle to, to manage. But, but now that's much more complex and you get into a really well-trained machine learning algorithm with really good inputs. We'll have, you know, tens of millions of outputs um, in the form of models that have to be processed in real time. And that layer is, you know, really the, uh, for me, in terms of implementation, that's the tricky layer. Yeah, I think mean, that's really where Ben was too. And I think you can take yeah. these models, you can clearly take these models and if you have X breadth of data, you can train it. And when you take it out to Y or Z breadth of data, it will only improve from that point forward. So getting that ecosystem in place is hugely important. Okay, thank you, Bobby. That was super insightful. I think the next thing we'll go to is talk a little bit about um, what Datalex is. Well, we'll talk a little bit about where the industry is headed specifically around dynamic pricing and then, and then some of the capability that Datalex has. But with that, I'll turn it over to Connor to, to um, provide that insight. So Connor, take it from here. Great. Thanks very much, Blair. Um, and, and thank you, everyone, for, for joining today. Um, Maybe to even just follow on again from what, what, what Ben and, and, and Bobby had been saying, um, I mean, the view within Datalex is very strong that the world of dynamic offer <clears throat> and the world of dynamic pricing incorporates two very specific uh, areas. One of them is what we call about price determination, which focuses really on the world of dynamic pricing. Uh, the items that Ben spoke about in terms of the dynamically pricing ancillary seats or as we talk about ancillary fares. Uh, but the other just as key area that we focus on in Datalex is what we call product determination. So determining how you source your products, then how you optimize those products and how you present those products back to the user. So within Datalex, I mean, we have a very large focus on ensuring there is a level of independence on how you source your products. So we have no tie to any underlying PSS. We don't have any tie to any specific dynamic pricing engine. What we have in Datalex is the ability to source from multiple systems, both airfare and ancillary systems, whether it's ATP co-optional services, whether it's the Datalex product catalog, whether it's the import of an external product catalog. And what we do in Datalex is we source all those products back in one offer, back uh, uh, through our APIs, and only at that point do we optimize that offer. And then through our segmentation or our personalization capabilities that we have in Datalex, do we look to decide what actual products to bring back to the users. And how we bring those back to the users in Datalex is a little bit different to some of our uh, competitors. Uh, we do this through, we feel, a, a, a highly innovative retailing uh, uh, 
way through the likes of shopping carts and wish list functionality that we can present back to the user in, in somewhat of a different mode. And this is what we feel in DataLex a very key part of your dynamic offer and your dynamic pricing strategy is firstly to ensure you get your product determination strategy correct. You ensure that when you source your products, you don't tie yourself to one specific uh, vendor, that you're, you have that agnostic or independence to go to multiple sources and when one works or one doesn't, that you can move on uh, to another. The second aspect then is obviously dynamic pricing. And what I wanted to talk today is there's obviously a number of parameters that are used uh, consistently in the world of dynamic pricing. And if you look at what COVID has done or brought to us within the world, it's a little bit of uncertainty in this area. So if you look at one of the trends and Ben even mentioned this early on, some of the historical data and forecasting models they're pretty much irrelevant right now within the COVID world. So we're in a situation that is not as predictable as, as it was before. Uh, customer life cycle value, uh, the import of uh, customer data warehouse analytics, all of this has kind of been turned on its head with what uh, uh, COVID has done. The second area or parameter that's used extensively in the world of dynamic pricing is competitive pricing. And in your very optimized scenario, you have two competitive airlines with two sophisticated dynamic pricing algorithms, both gaining optimized results based on their uh, dynamic pricing algorithms. But what we're seeing, or what we've already seen in some of the green shoots of COVID in certain parts of the world is mass promotional sales. We've seen some competitor uh, airlines who do not have sophisticated uh, uh, dynamic pricing uh, uh, algorithms that are just really trying to bring back passengers. <clears throat> and by using that competitive pricing in your model, you are uh, compromising uh, what could be your optimized return. The other thing then that we're seeing a lot of is this demand-based pricing. So we're in very unpredictable market conditions, uh, government restrictions, demand forecasts, very difficult to do and fundamental changes in consumers and demand patterns uh, and very different in, in different regional contexts as well. And then the final thing, and I think Bobby touched on this a little bit, was around product price association or uh, the fact that multiple products uh, and your product sourcing capability has, directly, uh, has a direct impact on how you should dynamically price your products. So what we would see with a lot of the immature dynamic pricing systems is they would focus very much on just the airfare as an example and dynamically price the airfare. But actually what they're doing in the background is they're causing um, their ancillary revenue to be cut as a consequence or they're not taking into effect that the price association required against both your ancillary products and your airfare products is where your algorithm needs to be taken into account. So some of the sophistication around dynamic bundling or dynamic fair families is, is a real important initiative in order to do this. So these are some of the, the, the parameters that I'm sure most people are used to seeing within the dynamic pricing element. So how we in DataLex see how we would solve some of this is one, we feel you need a set of capabilities that allows you to be incredibly flexible within how you source your products, how you decide what parameters to use as part of your dynamic pricing models, which ones to be able to very quickly turn on and off. And we, ha we have a tool or capability within DataLex that is designed for business users to allow you to very quickly react to market conditions around your airfare and ancillary products. How to contextualize which which segments of the market you want to go after, or if you want to go after a personalized market, which parameters to use to bring back to our users. And I think that becomes a really important capability within the world of COVID and dynamic offer and dynamic pricing. The second area that we feel in DataLex is really important is to give yourself as an airline the capability 
to be able to run as much multivariant testing from as many sources as possible and to be able to turn off sources um, quickly as possible. So how we work in Datalex, and I've used pricing, your airfare pricing as an example here, how we work in Datalex is we do not limit the number of sources in which you can bring back your content from. So, for example, we have our own capability for full ATP co pricing, as an example, within Datalex. We also have the capability to go out to a dynamic pricing system, and we also have the capability, if you so wish, to go to a PSS price system like Flex Pricer within Amadeus or uh, the similar within Sabre. So, what you can decide to do is bring back all offers in one shot through your offer request within Datalex. And only when all those offer uh, uh, priced options are returned, will we run the sorting, deduplication, filtering, et cetera, run the offer optimization that I spoke about a little bit uh, uh, on in order to return the right offer to the user. So if you're concerned about having to run a new dynamic pricing engine across your, your full system, we give the capability to be able to run that in very segmented pieces of the market. And you can decide at a RBD, route, cabin, seat level, what, uh, 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 how you would like to offer those dynamically priced. Um, and this doesn't involve mass change or within the system. This is just done by changing a configuration and connecting out to that relevant system. And I think that's something that is an essential element as we move further into the world of dynamic pricing, um, that we feel that the airlines will not make these big bang approaches in order to bring in dynamic price systems, that there's an element of multivariant testing that will be required in order to optimize and decide exactly how that works. Maybe, maybe one comment on top of that, Connor, you know, if you look at implementing a different pricing strategy, more of a dynamic pricing strategy, maybe for even a core seat, and you're using ATP co-filed fares right now, having the ability to take a market, maybe an origin, maybe a market, maybe just an origin, and dynamically price that to minimize the risk, you're well positioned if you have one service that actually presents the offer back that you can test and learn and not have to make dramatic changes to the customer experience in order to do that. So I think drawn up what you said a little bit is that's a, that's a big advantage of, let's just say, having a common offer service in general, because you could maybe behind the scenes build some rules in on how you want to, where, where you want to implement dynamic pricing, but then specifically Datalex provides that, that ability, but we'd recommend that regardless of whether it was our technology or not. Correct. And, and, and whether you present that seat price, as you said, Blair, back to the user, or whether you just run that dynamic seat price, use the traditional uh, uh, ATP Co optional service priced uh, fare for, for the seat. And in the background, you have that ability to compare those prices get comfortable with that uh, uh, scenario and uh, over time decide when and where to run that dynamically priced uh, uh, seat yeah. in the market. That's where, that's where the model is going to break a little bit, even of the traditional data structures and, and way we do pricing. I know everybody on, on the call from Maryland probably knows that, but it's actually a conversation we've been having with Jeff Bloom Ben about if you create these dynamic prices, even for seats and you want to file them through ATP Co and you want to do it on a very, um, dynamic basis, both in terms of time and price, how will that business process, you know, work? And I think business process change in the airline around dynamic pricing is something that the airlines really got to get their heads around and spend some time on that. That's a really important, uh, you know, uh, piece to, to move into the dynamic pricing. Maybe one other thing I was thinking about when you were talking, Connor, is it does seem pretty scary to the airlines in my experience to have this, uh, dynamic product determination because in the end you do have to actually fulfill the service so if you're coming up with incredibly dynamic offers that package together different products and services the question could be to a lot of people like how are you ultimately going to deliver that service and how dynamic can that be i know you and i have talked about you know and and, and learning with some airlines a way to have you know file many different fare bundles or fare options 
and then choose which one you're going to display, you might just cover a little bit of thoughts about how you could ease into the product determination side, even ahead of the pricing. Yeah. So, and, and, and again, what we would have is we have customers who would, from a dynamic pricing perspective, move into the world of kind of adjusted markups and markdowns. So what would be commonly called in the market as kind of dynamic discounting. So the ability to set up a number of rules in order or a number of situations in order to dynamically mark up or mark down the fare based on certain conditions within the market. And what that is, is that's a stepping stone into the world of the, the real purest AI machine learning dynamic pricing uh, elements. Um, and that's one side on the dynamic pricing. And I think where you were getting on the, the, the product determination a little bit, Blair, is where we've seen a lot of use cases is the ability to uh, do things like dynamic fair families uh, and both dynamic bundling. And we've seen kind of two major use cases that we've implemented uh, uh, at the moment. One would be for say something like corporate users to have the ability to have maybe a dedicated fair family for a particular corporate customer. So one of our examples is Spotify, who we would, for example, as a corporate customer uh, of one of our airlines, would have a very specific fair family that gives them free lounge access and priority boarding at certain points in time. And depending on your hierarchy level within, the air, within Spotify, you get the ability to get some additional ancillaries within your fair family. And what that is, is that's a very specific way to have a, a, a dynamic fair family that exists uh, uh, just for a specific corporate user. Yeah. Dynamic bundling is, is, is a little bit different. And this is the second use case that we've implemented, which is very much focused on only when you bring back all of your airfares, would you run all of your ancillary uh, uh, merchandising requests and when you've brought back all of your content uh, um, in your one offer shot, only then would you decide what would fit into what bundle. So for example, if you had Wi-Fi only available on certain flights, that's something traditionally you would not offer in a fair family or a bundle because it's only uh, it's, it's not a, 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 a static. What we can do is give the ability to bring back all of that content. And if Wi-Fi is available on that flight, we can offer that within the package and give some dy uh, dynamic nature to the ability to create what we call dynamic bundling. Yeah. Okay, great, great stuff, Connor. I think we'll wrap up kind of the formal presentation here. Maybe just a few takeaways is one is dynamic pricing, uh, dynamic product determination is here. The time is now to start testing and learning with this. And I think airlines need to come out, coming out of COVID-19 needs to start taking advantage of some of these new pricing techniques in order to thrive on the backside of COVID-19. Another big takeaway from Ben and, and followed up by Bobby is collecting the data is hugely important and getting it into a position that you can actually leverage it is, is a, is a, big piece of work and it's a prerequisite in a lot of cases to being able to, to really take advantage of the dynamic pricing. Probably the third thing I would say take away is there is a way to crawl, walk, run into dynamic pricing. There, this isn't you have to go away from ATP Co fair filing across your entire network all at once. There's ways to ease into this that can drive real value and drive real return without having to be as disruptive as to change your, your complete pricing techniques um, moving forward. So I think those are just some key takeaways and uh, you know, a plug for us is we're a well, company that's well positioned technically to help you through that journey as you step into you know, dynamic pricing. So with that, I can open it up. We have a little bit of time for some questions for those who've stuck around. Um, if you have any questions, if you just put something into the chat um, I can grab the questions. I'll see them come in and, uh, and I'll, I'll um, hand them out to the appropriate uh, panelists if, uh, as I see fit. So if you have any questions, maybe just um, type it into the chat box and I'll, I'll grab it. I'm waiting. Wait another minute or so. Nothing's coming in right now, guys. So, 
So for just while, while we're waiting maybe for a question or so to come in, Blair, maybe a question for Ben in the decision-making process of, of going with seats as the, the first area within the world of dynamic pricing. Was, what was the th thinking around that um, um, that made you decide to go with seats? Yeah, we thought that it was, um, you know, I think that, so firstly, we were, well, there was a parallel project that's also working around more dynamic uh, fair pricing as well. Um, but, you know, when you're thinking about a sort of data science project, especially if it's um, maybe a new team within your company or a first time sort of project that you want to deliver on, you want to find something that's sort of bite sized. Um, and it wasn't sort of tackling dynamic fair pricing may have been a bit too big of a first problem for a new data science team to tackle. Um, the other um, the other bit of it as well was trying to understand like what is the status quo and whether there's an opportunity for a stepwise improvement. You know, we think that the, you know, even if you know, we haven't achieved, you know, next generation dynamic fair pricing, you know, Jet, JetBlue feels quite confident in the way that we go about doing that. Right? We have a lot of attention and focus on it. And what we found with our ancillary product, our even more space was that we thought that there was room to grow. Um, there maybe weren't as many resources or minds focused on it, especially being pulled in so many directions um, leading up uh, to the pandemic and through it. So, so seed pricing, you know, it really was, uh, there was a lot of uh, gain to be had. Um, it was a bite-sized project. And I think that it was also um, not something that was so immediately uh, I mean, it is absolutely core to our business, but it wasn't sort of this massive problem uh, in fair pricing that maybe would have, you know, getting buy-in from your stakeholders is really critical. Um, and so we, my team was working in partnership with revenue management. So we had to learn to uh, earn their trust um, and work towards it together. So that's, that's sort of what made the seat pricing uh, an interesting first project. But we've, you know, we've already thought about this uh, in terms of many ancillary products. Why couldn't you do the same thing for bags? Why couldn't you do the same thing for you name it product? Um, and we're hoping that once we sort of fully productionalized uh, it for even more space seats, that that will be an opportunity for us to try it in other areas as well. Yeah, and the, the thing I think Ben said there, and just because I have some insight into JetBlue is it's really not an or, it's an end. It's seats and looking at you know, the core air, airline seat pricing. So you can be working on them both at the same time, don't have to be working on one. So I think that's actually a unique thing that JetBlue is doing. I was looking at it across different, both the core seat and, and the ancillary. I did have one question that come in and we're getting close to the time, but one is just, you know, how does dynamic pricing play into NDC projects? So those who aren't familiar, I'm sure everybody on here is familiar with the NDC, the new distribution. Um, we are an NDC provider, but we're a certified NDC provider. And I think one of the things I had mentioned, I'll, I'll just take it, or maybe Connor, you could take, take that and just, you know, maybe, uh, talk a little bit about how NDC plays in, uh, how dynamic pricing plays into NDC. Yeah, sure. And I think, I think within the world of NDC, you, you we, we see two patterns within the airlines that come out. One is the airlines who are just looking to get that certification badge and aren't that interested in going too strategic beyond that. <clears throat> but for airlines who consider are considering moving away from the GDS to NDC and trying to move as much traffic from their indirect channel that's using uh, uh, the GDS over to NDC, we see that there is very little difference between how dynamic pricing will work for NDC as it will within your direct channel. What we do see is you get some more information around users like corporates, uh, where you will get some focused products on how you offer and the type of products you offer uh, becomes a little bit more important. So the product determination is a higher focus point for corporate users than the price determination. Um, um, uh, just right now, and specifically within the corporate market uh, uh, for users, it's 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 got a higher weighting of propensity to purchase the products that are given, uh, rather than the actual price that is given. 
Um, but we're seeing it as a as as a similar to the direct channel, a high focus um, um, within the dynamic. Okay, I got one more question. Um, what are the main requirements to make dynamic offers with Datalex in legacy O and D airline environment? I.e., it should be in the cloud. NDC is requirement structured data in the cloud, etc. Um, you know, I'd answer that by saying when it comes to Datalex, and I mentioned it a little bit earlier, is Datalex has an offer service. Ultimately, with our platform, we have an offer service. So if you implement a product within our platform, and we have several that could satisfy the requirement of being able to make dynamic offers, but if you implement our platform and, and the appropriate product, and you start to leverage that service uh, through your digital channel, one of the beauties of our platform is, is that we can, as Connor described, we can orchestrate the different pricing capabilities so we, you could price again, you know, the vast majority of your markets using the legacy pricing techniques, but pick a, you know, a specific O and D again, a specific just origin, you know, whatever by business rule that you want to ease into a dynamic offer, and then you could implement the dynamic offer in that market. So, bottom line is when it comes to the data lex capability to help you with dynamic pricing, you would have to implement one of the products that has our dynamic offer. Once you implement that, then we have the ability to, to be able to allow you to crawl, walk, run into the dynamic price, into your dynamic pricing strategy. Would you add anything to that, Connor? Uh, other than there is a, a, a very clear focus within our products that time to market is an essential element. So within our products, core focus for us is bringing value quickly to the market. Uh, for you as an airline. Um, yes. So within 30 days, you could get one of our base level uh, products uh, 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 to uh, around some areas of, of ancillary merchandising, yeah. as an example. The more, and the other thing that, you know, if it hasn't been clear, is we have the ability to work with your data teams to be able to take some of your price determination again, you know, case in point is Ben's use case around seat pricing and then implement that price, get that price to market and then even apply business rules or dynamic markups or markdowns on that based upon personalization or whatever you choose to be able to do that. Okay, with that, I think we're up against the time. So I just wanna thank the presenters, first of all, and, so, and most importantly, the uh, airlines that joined us today. So uh, if you have any follow-up questions, please reach out to us and we can schedule time with you. We'd love to spend time with your airline and, and go into more detail if you'd like that. And I think we're gonna make the slides available too also. So um, again, thank you all and look forward to further conversations. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.